The new features of the monthly webinars uh, this year is we've been highlighting an activity to this month's topic. This month we're looking at a planet which has been an object of fascination for as long as people have looked up at the night sky. Mars has played a central role in much of the mythology associated with life beyond Earth and with all of the missions that have explored it in the last 50 years, and I'm going all the way back into the Mariner probes and actually more than 50. Um, it remains an object of intense interest, and I think that Sharon is uh, incredibly interested in it, and he's going to be sharing some things um, about the, the next upcoming mission. Well, one resource in particular uh, allows you and the, your visitors at your outreach events to explore the red planet in detail. That's Mars Trek. And we actually had uh, a webinar from Brian Day back in 2016 about Mars Trek. And you can find a link to Mars Trek uh, on this webinar's outreach resource page. And we'll also put that into the chat window here in a minute. Mars Trek allows you to select and look at layers of data from the various orbital missions. And so I just want to share my screen just ever so briefly here and kind of give you a little sense of what it does, and so hopefully we see Mars Trek up here. Hopefully that's what you're looking at, and I've got all these little chat windows kind of here, there, and everywhere, so I can actually see what I'm looking at. Now, one of the really cool things that you can do in Mars Trek is you can zoom in, and you can look at all these different features on it. You can navigate around and really explore the surface of Mars. And so one of the things that, uh, um, is also really cool is that there's a set of layers. And if you click on here, there's a whole set of different layers that you can overlay on this and you can toggle the visibility and you can see some of the different features and from some of the different missions. And so here we've got, we can see where the Mars dichotomy is up here. We could go, we could turn that off and we could go to a more high resolution black and white imaging of it and you could zoom in and really get a sense of some of the things that are that you can see on here. You can also go to where the different landing sites are. There is a layer for where the uh, proposed 2020, uh, Mars Rover 2020 landing sites are. And so this is a really cool thing. Um, go back and check out the, uh, the old webinar that Brian Day, Day did for us. Um, you can check this out, and it's a really fun thing that you can use with your in your outreach or just for yourself too. I've got a, I've had a great time playing around with it and refreshing my memory of how how it works. So, uh, one more really great resource that we can use to explore Mars at our leisure. So, one of the things also. Um, we have a chat window and a Q&A window. Please make sure that you put any questions for Dr. Kadar in the Q&A window. That way we'll manage to keep track of your questions and be able to get to them at the end. And now for our featured program. Sharon Kadar obtained his BSc in Geophysics and Planetary Science from Tel Aviv University in 1985 and a PhD in Geophysics from Caltech's Seismological Laboratory in 1996. He also served as an NSF postdoc at the USGS Volcano Hazards Program in the late 90s. He joined JPL's Geodynamics and Ge Space Geodesy Group in 2001. At JPL, Sharon worked on a variety of earth science and applications projects, as well as on mission concepts in instrument formulation in the earth, planetary, and astrophysics area. He is the InSight Mission Seismic Experiment for Interior Structure Investigation Scientist. That's a mouthful. So we could just say he's a seismologist and uh, that's, you know, he has a lot of passion for this. It, it's, uh, there's a lot that we can learn from uh, seismology. So please welcome Sharon Kadar. Hi Dave, can uh, everybody see me or, or hear me? Yes, to both. Okay, so I'm gonna share my presentation. And I'm going to put it in slideshow mode and then we'll get started. And thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, so, um, as you said, I'm a seismologist. Uh, I'm actually one member of a very large uh, science team. Those, uh, those missions, this is what we call a discovery class mission. You, you may be aware of different uh, 
uh, programs in NASA. Um, the Discovery class is a fairly large mission that has uh, several hundred people working on it. It's an international mission uh, with contribution from the French Space Agency that are contributing the seismometer. Uh, the German Space Agency uh, contributing a heat probe. We'll talk about those instruments in specific. The mission is managed out of JPL. And the PI, uh, the principal investigator, is Dr. Bruce Bannert, who uh, couldn't be with us today. And I would have to say uh, he's really the expert for this mission. I'm filling in for him. As you said, my, my background is in seismology. And um, um, as so I can answer questions on many aspects of the mission, but uh, perhaps uh, not as well as Bruce on some of them. Uh, if I can't answer those questions, I'll make sure I can get back to you uh, later on. Uh, Brian, a quick uh, technical question for you. How do I see my own camera uh, at the same time? That um, that's a good question. Dave, is that up? Uh, where's the command for that? It's not critical. We can uh, we can just uh, go on without it. But for some reason, I can't see my own camera, my own face. So, um, Dave, you're muted. Speaking of technical issues, okay. Uh, in the right hand corner of your screen, you may see um, a kind of a series of small sort of squarish icons, and if okay. you toggle between those, it'll give you slightly different views of the presentation. So one view just gives you, there's one view where there's nothing, there's one where you just kind of see a gallery view that might help turn that on or off. Okay. Uh, I don't want to waste everybody's time on this. So it's, uh, it's okay if we, if we don't have it. Uh, um, it's okay. I know what I look like. So we'll, Looks good. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll go with that. All right. So, um, uh, the insight mission, uh, which will basically place the first geophysical station uh, uh, on Mars, um, will launch out of Vandenberg Air Force Base this coming May. May 5th is when the launch uh, window opens. And um, it uh, will arrive on November 26 and operate for one full Mars year, roughly two Earth years. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the launch later. As you know, the mission was uh, supposed to launch in 2016 and where there were some delays. We'll talk briefly about that. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, this mission and uh, what it's really all about. Uh, the mission is, uh, main objective is to study, uh, well, obviously the interior of Mars, but uh, really a little beyond that. Uh, so learn more about rocky planet formation in general. And uh, we know a lot, of course, about the Earth, and we know some about the moon, the lunar interior. Uh, we know in both cases, we know that from quakes, which uh, are the equivalent source of, uh, similar to, to the analogy I'd like to give is ultrasound, uh, this uh, sound waves, or in our case, elastic waves, that bounce off interior boundaries within the planetary body. But uh, we really have only one data point, one good data point about the rocky planet history and formation, which is Earth. And uh, it'll be very informative uh, to get another data point. We know something about the moon. Uh, the Apollo uh, missions did have seismometers back in the 70s. Uh, the last one was turned off in September of uh, 1977. Uh, but uh, they were great instruments, but they were obviously limited by technology that was available at the time. Uh, and um, so our knowledge of the moon is not perfect. Also, the moon is very small. Um, and we'll talk a, a little bit about why Mars uh, in, just, in just a moment. So um, the set of slides, I mean, they're, they're really nice. So the, the occasional corny uh, figure 
Um, so I hope you're not bothered by that, but I make a point. Uh, we think about it as a measurement going back in time. Uh, we want um, to, we, we really only uh, started understanding what's inside the Earth at the turn of the 20th century when seismometers were developed. Before that, even the theory of what quakes were, people knew, of course, there were quakes, but uh, what quakes really were uh, and how uh, the, the fact they emanate from uh, an epicenter, uh, this was not uh, actually uh, agreed upon fact uh, at the turn of the 20th century. So I would say we're, we're basically doing zero order science on Mars. So starting to just understand what is the thickness of the crust? What is the structure of the mantle? The size and density of the core? And uh, what is the distribution of the seismicity? And the implication of all these uh, questions to the history of Mars. Um, and one particularly thing, interesting thing about Mars is uh, that uh, it can help us understand the process of planetary differentiation in general, on, we think, on other rocky planets. Um, as um, you know, um, the Earth has a, um, uh, we have plate tectonics, which cur curiously wasn't an agreed upon fact either until the uh, 60s. Um, I think they, they tell at the uh, Caltech Seismolab that they used to mock the idea in, in this, the Caltech Seismolab in the early 60s. Uh, Wegener came with uh, the concept of uh, uh, plate tectonics, uh, uh, in, I believe in the 30s, based on paleontology, the study of fossils and looking at patterns. And he was laughed out of the room. Scientists can be pretty narrow-minded sometimes. So, um, but back to the relevance to this mission, plate tectonics basically recycles the formation in, in uh, history. So when we have a planet like Earth, we have a good snapshot of what its state is now uh, and some hints about its formation. Of course, we have a lot of data, but uh, we, uh, a lot of this information, the crust itself gets recirculated um, every couple million hundreds of years. So uh, having a planet like Mars that does not have plate tectonics is uh, very useful in that sense to study the, the history of its interior and maybe learn something about other rocky planets from it. And uh, we will do this with um, uh, several techniques that we'll talk about. Uh, seismology being the main one, but there are other techniques that we'll be using, uh, precision, precision tracking, basically a form of geodesy um, and heat flow measurements. Um, now, a little bit about the formation of planetary interiors. Um, planet, um, the, the interior of planets, as it says on, on the slide, is comprised, uh, comprised of the, the heat engine that drives uh, the interior processes. processes. Um, it's a dynamic process that uh, shapes the surface, as, as we talked about plate tectonics on Earth, and in other ways where you don't have plate tectonics. An example for Mars is Olympus Mons. When you don't have plate tectonics and the crust is stationary uh, versus, uh, relative to the interior and you have a big heat source that keeps spilling lava on the surface at one point, you create the largest volcano in the solar system, which is Olympus Mons. Um, it provides many of the necessary conditions for a planet planet to become and remain habitable, uh, as is the case uh, on Earth. Um, and it retains the fingerprints of the planet's origins, overprinted to some degree by its subsequent uh, evolution. Now, 
Um, terrestrial planets share some common structures that, that uh, to the best of our knowledge, understanding, and models. Um, and uh, we believe that there are these commonalities of having a core, a mantle, and a crust uh, are a result of um, a um, formation sequence uh, that is common to uh, planets as they accre accrete from material that comes together through, through gravitational pull early in their evolution. Um, so why go to Mars again? So we have the information on interiors, as I said, of only uh, closely related to terrestrial planets, the Earth and the Moon. We obviously know a lot more about the Earth than the Moon. Uh, and much of the Earth's early structure evidence uh, has been recycled by plate tectonics. And the Moon is, is pretty small. And you see the, the different sizes here, the relative sizes of Mars, Earth, and Moon. Um, and so we think the Moon may not actually be a very good rep representative of most rocky planets just because of its size. Mars, however, is large enough to have undergone some of the key terrestrial processes, which we'll talk about in a second, and the formation of the core and the mantle and the crust, this process where materials separate, which we call fractionation. And, but it is small enough to have retained evidence of its early activity. Because it doesn't have plate tectonics, we, we think that it bears the fingerprints of its early formation processes. And that is uh, one of those corny things, is the, the uh, Goldilocks uh, analogy. We think it's just right, just the right size. All right, so how does a terrestrial planet form, or a rocky planet, how, uh, how does it form? So the planet starts forming through accretion uh, of meteoritic material. It's basically gravitational pull as more material gathers together. Uh, it has a, an increased gravity. Um, and as it grows, the interior begins to, it begins to heat up and melts and then something happens and uh, after a while you end up with a, a planet that looks like Earth or Mars which uh, has a crust, a mantle, a core and um, with distinct uh, non-meteoritic composition. Material um, differentiates or fractionates where heavy, heavier stuff goes to the center. What insight is um, uh, uh, focus, uh, focusing on is how, what happens between the very early accretion to uh, where we are today. And again, because Mars is a Goldilocks uh, scenario, we think that it will uh, give us a pretty good idea of that early stage of formation of a planet that has not recycled its history. Um, this um, is a uh, cartoon uh, version of uh, an example of, of the, the general process of formation where uh, you have molten stuff early on, as we said, from accretion and heating. Uh, the metals, which are heavier, sink to the center, you have a metallic core, and then you start getting layering where uh, you have distinct chemical boundaries uh, that uh, where minerals are formed uh, because uh, it, it's very specific temperature and pressure conditions that relate to when the composition on the planet and its size and of course its history where it is in the, in the stage of history and this differentiation, differentiation process. And this process, it depends on the planet, but it will continue to grow and you end up with uh, a more or less quasi-permanent um, uh, picture of its interior uh, where you have a core, uh, a mantle, and a crust with distinct boundaries as we observe them today. Now, we know very little actually about 
Mars, as I mentioned, compared to Earth, um, we have huge uncertainties uh, in the thickness of the crust. We may not, I don't think we even know it to a factor of two right now. Uh, how big is the mantle and how big is the core? Is it liquid? Is it solid? And these questions are key to understanding the formation of, uh, of the planet. Uh, what state is it in? And since we think this uh, state is actually relatively close to where it was when it formed, uh, what does it tell us about planet formation in general? So let's get to a little bit more specifics of what we're trying to do. So we're looking at the crust and its thickness and the layering within the crust, which reflects the depth and crystallization processes of the magma ocean and the early post-differentiation evolution of the planet. So plate tectonics versus crustal overturn versus immobile crust. Um, I, don't, I, I don't even actually pretend to know all the, the details of the differences of the models. The point is that uh, the thickness and the layering of the crust tell us something about the uh, composition and uh, the state of the magma ocean early on in the process. The mantle, its behavior, meaning is it convecting? Uh, is it generate, is, does it have pockets of partial melt? Uh, determines the manifestation of the thermal history of the planet. And it depends directly on the thermal structure and the stratification. And the core, uh, its size and composition, uh, density will tell us uh, pretty accurately what it's co composed of. We know the density of uh, the Earth core. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about how we know the density. Um, reflects condition of acc accretion and the early differentiation and its state versus liquid or solid reflects its composition and the thermal history of the planet. So what INSIGHT is trying to do is answer all these questions. And in what we call uh, level one requirements. So the level one mission requirements for all NASA missions, uh, these are the, the requirements uh, that the mission must achieve to be successful. Um, they're, ca they're cast in stone and everything in the mission design flows from those requirements um, down to the specific performance of the seismometer, its sensitivity, and um, how it's going to be deployed, uh, how it's going to rest on the surface, what is the spacecraft going to do, everything flows down from the level one requirement. And some of you may know this, but basically, uh, you have the level one requirement that is set by the science and it goes all the way down to level five, which is where the engineers are concerned. When you verify that, that that's what the engineers are concerned with. When an engineer verifies that uh, the require when level one requirement is met, they're really going down at the, at the roots of the tree at level five and it flows down up the tree all the way to level one. You, that's how you verify that the mission uh, can meet its level one requirements. So what are those level one requirements? Determine crustal, crustal thickness to within certain accuracies. It's not listed here, but this will be a bit of an eyeful. Um, large scale crustal layering, the seismic velocity in the upper mantle, solid uh, versus liquid core, core radius density, heat flux, rate of seismic activity, epicentral location, uh, uh, rate of meteorite impacts. Um, and I will just give you a hint that the level, since the level ones are, are cast in stone, uh, if an instrument through its verification validation program appears that it's not going to meet its level five, four, or three requirements, uh, you're not going to meet your level one requirement and you might get a mission delay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the payload. So 
Insight has several, quite a few instruments actually. The main instrument is SIS, uh, and these days we are in the day, days of acronyms and uh, uh, this is, I, I believe, I don't remember all the acronyms. I think this is Seismic Experiment of in, Interior of uh, something. It's a seismometer. And right here on the picture, uh, it's covered with a wind and thermal shield, WTS. Uh, and that is done because this is definitely not how we do seismology or we would like to do seismology anywhere else. This is a necessity on Mars. Typically, a seismic station on Earth, uh, you'll take your very sensitive seismometer, and we'll talk in just a few minutes about how sensitive is set very sensitive, and you either dig it on the ground or preferably go, you go to a mine shaft or a vault and uh, where it's very quiet and thermally stable and you leave it there. Um, we can't do this on Mars for practical reasons. So we have, we place it on the surface. Mars has an atmosphere, or, or, albeit very thin atmosphere. It still has atmosphere, winds, uh, dust storms, um, sandstorms, and, um, and dust devils, and you, they all generate seismic noise. You have to protect the seismometer, and that's why you have this wind and thermal shield on top of it. You have the heat probe um, uh, experiment, which we'll talk about. This is, uh, so I'm sorry, the seismometer is provided by the French Space Agency. Um, this is a J, the, the WTS here is a JPL design as is the robotic arm that places all these things on the instrument, on the, on the surface. The uh, lander is a Lockheed Martin lander uh, that's based on the Phoenix lander. Uh, the heat and thermal probe provide, is provided by this German space agency. And it's basically a mole or a penetrometer that with an internal self hammering mechanism that penetrates the interior basically one millimeter at a time down to a depth of five, about five meters. And it gathers behind it a tether that is uh, in, in which thermocouples are embedded. So it measures the thermal gradient uh, from the interior of the planet. And it has to go down a few meters uh, to get away from what we call the skin effect, the effect of both diurnal and seasonal effect. We're going to be on Mars for a full year. We also have RISE. RISE, these are basically two radio antennas that provide a direct to Earth link. Um, and this is the geodesy, space geodesy exper experiment I mentioned. Uh, we basically, uh, it's a measuring a Doppler shift of the radio wave direct to Earth, uh, from which we will track the uh, precession and mutation of the Martian uh, of, of Mars, um, which tell us something about the state of uh, the core, actually. Uh, the uh, popular analogy that people usually give is a, um, um, is the difference between spinning a soft boiled and a hard boiled, uh, an uncooked and a, and a hard boiled egg, um, where, uh, if uh, the state of the interior is liquid, they spin in entirely different ways. And now for a Diet Coke commercial. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. Um, okay. There are other instruments, um, auxiliary instruments. What you have here, the, the pressure inlet is actually a very sensitive microbarometer, and it's actually part of the seismic experiment. It's not just for weather. Um, as I mentioned, Mars has a, an atmosphere, and, and we know from Earth, um, pressure variations do um, generate seismic signals, and we want to not get false positives. Uh, so measuring the, uh, the pressure at the, at um, very and with very uh, with high degree of accuracy is very important for the seismic measurement. In fact, barometers are standard practice on most high quality seismic stations on Earth. We have two wind sensors. <clears throat> we have cameras. 
Uh, we have a scoop that we may or may not use. It's uh, part of the heritage design of Phoenix. And we have here a, a grapple with which the arm picks up those instruments from the deck after it lands and places it on the uh, surface of the planet. All right. I'm going to talk a little, a little bit about se seismometers. And uh, some of you may know that, uh, but uh, the risk of uh, teaching you something you know. A seismometer system is, a, uh, is actually a very simple principle. Uh, it's either a, a mass or on a, on a spring, as, uh, as um, shown here, or a pendulum, or some combination of both. And the idea is, if you have the mass and you have a, uh, and it's anchored to an inertial system, when that inertial system moves, you get a differential motion between the mass and the inertial system, and that's your seismic measurement. That's how much the ground moves. The problem starts, uh, the problem has always been in the details and how to make these things practical. A seismometer is very sensitive to um, ground motion that is um, shorter or higher in frequency than its natural frequency. Okay, think of a pendulum. If you move it really fast compared to its natural period, let's just say it oscillates, uh, you know, once per second. Uh, if you move it really fast relative to that, you'll get the differential motion. If you move it really slow, the the differential motion between the mass and the inertial system will be almost um, unnoticeable. And in modern seismology, since the 80s, we have uh, fixed that with some tricks of the trade that basically sensitive electronics made a huge difference. Um, and also feedback system uh, made, a, uh, made, made a, a great contribution and in most modern seismometers, as InSight is, and it's modeled based on terrestrial seismometers, though for different gravity, right? So you have to design it for Martian gravity and, and, and conditions. Um, the mass actually hardly ever moves. Uh, you constantly put feedback back into the mass to try to prevent it from moving, and all you measure is how much current uh, you have to feed into the system to prevent the mass from moving, and that's how, and that current is proportional to ground velocity. And that's how we do seismology on Earth, and that's how, uh, that's what we'll do uh, on Mars. Now, how sensitive? This is actually an example that I don't particularly like. Uh, the people, uh, we uh, say that we can sense it, measure displacements, uh, roughly the size of a hydrogen atom. Uh, I find it a little bit hard to ex explain um, because we don't measure atomic phenomena with seismometers. Uh, but um, just um, maybe to illustrate this, um, you think about the very tiny motion you'd get from uh, uh, a tide, uh, like the, the solid tide, or uh, from a person who's jumping uh, up and down a couple miles away from your station, a good seismometer under good conditions should be able to easily sense that. A more, uh, actually this is real data um, of how uh, that illustrates how sensitive seismometers are. We installed a seismometer in uh, Littleton, Colorado, near Denver, where Lockheed Martin was building the seismometer, I'm sorry, the, the lander. And we installed a seismometer there because we were going to test the flight seismometer, the inside seismometer there, and we needed a reference seismometer to measure the building noise and everything else. Now we're in Colorado. What we see, so this is what we call a time spectral plot. So what you see here is time um, and the tick marks on the bottom, this is 50,000 seconds. So we're looking about a week's worth of data on the x-axis and the frequency between zero and 0.5 hertz. So right here, 
point one is about 10 seconds, five seconds of ground motion. And when we look at a time like this, events have very distinct signature. We can identify things like these at that at this frequency band and remember this actually it's, it's important for what we're going to talk about later so here's 20 second 10 seconds this is really where most the bulk of seismology is done at periods between i'd say a few tens of seconds to one second we need long waves to detect uh to study structure on a planetary scale. We need waves that, elastic waves of several kilometers length, and they translate to waves of these periods. You'll also notice here this kind of fuzzy, fuzzy band here. That fuzzy band is the ocean. Now, remember, we're in, in Denver, and we see the ocean. And to the train eye, you could actually see that this band here, you'll have to take my word for it, is a Pacific ocean swell system, where this one here is an Atlantic ocean swell system. They have distinct signature and a slightly different frequency content. So that's how sen sensitive these seismometers are. And it's both a blessing and a curse on Earth. Uh, a blessing because when I put a seismometer down anywhere on Earth, one way to check if it's functioning is do I see the ocean? It's a curse because when I try to test a seismometer for Mars, all I see is the ocean on Earth. So how do you test a seismometer that is going to go to Mars on Earth where you have all these noise sources? <clears throat> so uh, the way we do it is by uh, basically differentiating. Take two identical seismometers, a seismometer and a reference seismometer, and differentiate the noise. So let's look at the seismometer that is uh, on Mars. So this chart is a bit of an eyeful. This is what the actual seismometer lo looks like before. As you'll see later, it's covered with a thermal blanket, not the wind and thermal shield that goes on top of it, but a thermal blanket. And this is an evacuated sphere. The, the seismometer is a near-perfect vacuum. And it's actually, and this is what the actual seismometer looks like. Uh, you have this leaf spring. It's an inverted pendulum. That's actually the pendulum body. VBB stands for very broad band. We want a seismometer that measures a very broad band of frequencies, as I mentioned, from maybe 100 seconds to one second. So we have three of those and uh, because we have three components of motion, uh, up and down, north, south, east, west. Um, the nice trick about this one is that th these are all identical to each other. And the reason is it's basically a configuration of a cube that's tilted on one of its points. And the decomposition into vertical north, south, east, west is done in, uh, basically through the electronics. We also have backup short period seismometer. There may be a factor of 10 less sensitive, but a lot smaller. And they reside in these boxes on the outside of the sphere. You see one of them right here. You see another one right there. And then this whole sphere is sitting on a leveling system uh, that can take up to a 15 degree slope at the landing site. We have to be very close to being leveled on the surface of Mars, as is true for any seismometer, uh, to make good measurements. Other uh, components of the uh, uh, size system so we have the e-boxes, basically the data logger, and the, th the thing that logs the data and, and then uh, it communicates with the sp spacecraft to send it to Earth. We have the R-Web, which is, as I said, the thermal blanket, the wind and thermal shield with its like, skirt thing that, again, if we land on a slope, it can adjust itself or, or even to some rocks. It, can it has some flexibility to still seal against the ground. Um, we have a tether a long tether that connects the seismometer to the spacecraft. We don't want to stay on the spacecraft like Viking did, because um, as Viking showed us, we'll be sensitive mostly to wind noise. 
So we place it on the surface, and it has to be connected to the spacecraft somehow. And the solution that uh, the engineers came up with is a tether. Uh, it was contemplated early on whether to do it wirelessly. There, there's pros and cons. Um, there is a load shunt assembly. I probably, for the interest of time, I won't bore you with the details. It's just a way of isolating tether motion from the seismometer, and the, the tether is coiled up inside a tether box. All right, so what are the signals we're going to see? Well, we have some rough estimates of Mars seismicity. Uh, basically, well, we're looking at here are the magnitudes on top. Um, and there are models that tells us how much energy, in a sense, what we call moment, seismic moment, which is sort of equivalent to seismic energy, not exactly. Uh, but it's OK to think about in terms of energy. Um, how much moment will be released in a Martian year? Um, and we have models of the seismicity that indicate that it'll probably be about a factor of a thousand less than on Earth, give or take quite a bit. One of the things we want to constrain is exactly uh, the number of quakes that we think, we'll, if we don't see any quakes, we would be pretty surprised. There'll be a tide from the tiny moon Phobos well, that uh, will generate some ground motion. Uh, just like on Earth, we have of course, the ocean tide, but we have also a solid Earth tide, as the Earth's gravity corresponds to the position of the moon. And we'll have meteorite impacts. Uh, and we anticipate, based on our, of our knowledge of impact rates, uh, that we should be able to see maybe a dozen or two impacts with our seismometer. And perhaps after identifying them with the seismometer, talk to some of the uh, um, orbiters and try to look for the actual impact point. And we'll have atmospheric excit excitation of seismic ground motion that actually can also be used as it is on Earth to study the interior. Um, we're going to have a seismic, a single seismic station. Um, and um, on Mars, I'm going to actually jump ahead to this slide for, for, for time. On Earth, we, do, uh, we have the luxury of having a seismic network. We couldn't fit a seismic network on, on Mars. Uh, it was not in the cards and not in the budget. You need multiple landers. Uh, there have been concepts, and people have tried to fit it within the cost cap. It's just not doable, so uh, people had to do some uh, smart things in order to um, be able to do seismology with a single station. So how do we do this? Um, here is your station right here, this triangle. Here is a quake. And the quake generates, as you probably all remember from high school, P waves, S waves, surface waves. Now, if quakes are large enough, the surface wave propagates in all directions. So you'll get, we call it R because it stands for Rayleigh wave. These are polarized waves. They are the largest amplitudes of waves uh, that we observe during a quake. It's the same on Earth. Uh, there are surface waves. They propagate only in two dimensions, not, like, not in three dimensions, like uh, uh, the P and S, what we call body waves, that propagate through the body of the planet. And as a result, these um, uh, these are much larger. They only decay or geometrically spread in two dimensions rather than in three. This is why they're the most destructive waves during a quake. So anyway, we have the first one, the second one. If the quake is really large enough, we can get one that goes one time and one time again around the planet. And you, you, you can use all these uh, uh, measurements the time of the P wave, S wave, R1, R2, and R3, to determine five parameters. The velocity of the Rayleigh wave, that tells us immediately something about the crust, the distance, uh, the origin time. Remember, with these, we don't have the exactly the time. We have relative time, but not origin time. 
but five parameters, five variables, origin time, the P wave velocity, S wave velocity. You can look at these equations and, and uh, do some algebra and see that if you have these five observations, you can verify these uh, five variables. And do we think that we'll have big enough quakes to do that? Well, remember Mars is smaller. So if on Earth it may take a magnitude seven or so to get this kind of behavior, a magnitude four and a half might be sufficient on Mars. Um, the heat probe I mentioned is uh, going to te uh, tether itself into the ground and measure the, the thermal gradient uh, with thermocouples along it. And uh, that's what it looks like. It has a self-hammering mechanism. And here's a picture of the tether with the thermocouples on it. Um, it's actually, when you, when you hear it going, it, the, the little hammer inside sounds like almost like when you're uh, pulling on the trigger, trigger of an unloaded pistol. All right. Uh, I mentioned rise. Again, this is. Um, uh, Doppler measurements uh, of the position of the seismic station on Mars relative to Earth uh, to an accuracy within, of 10 centimeters and uh, will tell us something about the precession and nutation of the planet from which we can deduce something about the state of the core. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, Jump a little bit ahead. You, I mean, may, if you're interested in uh, learning a little bit about the delay, um, let's leave it to the Q and A's. I want to give enough time for Q and A's, and I see that I'm running out of time. Um, but I'll be happy to uh, talk about this and how it really all stems from our level, our very strict level one requirements that I mentioned early on. Um, InSight will launch from Vandenberg, California. Again, sorry, I apologize for the corny cartoons. Uh, if you're in the area, you should be able to see it. You should be able to see it from LA. It's going to go um, in a trajectory due south from uh, Vandenberg. And um, it's going to go be six months on cruise, landing November 26, just after Thanksgiving and a deployment that will last two months. And we'll, I'll show you a little video of that. They're much sped up uh, in just a minute. Uh, one Mars here on the surface and nominal end of mission, November 24. But usually, if, if all goes well, we hope that, and we hope that it will, we hope to extend the mission. All right, uh, landing site. Uh, is a very flat and boring site. Uh, we want to be away from obstacle. We want to be in a place where the uh, HP cube, the, pe the penetrometer can go in easily, five meters. May not be actually ideal for a seismometer. We, we prefer hard rock, but hard rock landing is risky. So uh, we have to compromise there. Uh, and then the, the placement, unlike Viking, will be on the surface of the planet. And uh, we're almost done, but I want to show you uh, a sped up version of the deployment sequence. And what you see here is the robotic arm with its grapple picking up the seismometer with its, its thermal blanket and placing it on the surface. Now, in reality, the rate of the arm movement would be more something like my arm here. So this is very sped up. Also, there are a lot of decision processes. Like, do I release? Is it time to release? Is it OK to release? That will involve Earth in the loop. All these add up with all these junk critical junctures in the deployment process that will uh, make it take a couple months to commission the instrument. Here's the heat and, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, wind and thermal shield, the WTS, and it's uh, placed on top 
of the seismometer, though not touching it. And then the arm will go back and um, pick up the uh, thermal probe and we'll place it about a meter away from the uh, seismometer. And you'll see it's dragging its tether. By the way, you see here the, the, the tether of the seismometer and its box that's sitting right under the lander deck right here. The power is solar as Phoenix was. And uh, with that, uh, I'll finish with this uh, last uh, image uh, from uh, the spirit lander um, of uh, uh, with the hope that we will learn something about Earth and other rocky planets by looking deep inside Mars. Thank you, uh, Brian, Dave, I'll be happy yeah. to take questions. Well, great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sharon. This is uh, really fascinating. As uh, originally a geologist, of, you know, I have a great fondness for uh, missions that are geological in nature. Um, we don't have any uh, open questions quite yet, but I have a question that, um, that I thought of uh, a while ago. And so you're hoping to notice whether that there's any differentiation within the interior of Mars. Well, one of the things a lot of times surface rocks can give some sort of an indication whether or not there's differentiation. Is there any evidence from any of the rocks that have been investigated by any of the rovers that suggest differentiation? That you know of? Uh, the short answer I do not know, um, uh, but um, I think that most, uh, I'm guessing here that most of the rocks that have been examined by the, uh, the rovers and especially by Curiosity, if they come from the interior, uh, deep interior, they'll have to be excavated through an impact cratering, they'll have to be pretty big. Or through, or come through uh, 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 through lava flows. I don't think that either of those come from very deep in the interior. But I'll, I'll have to to double check and refresh my memory to give you a better answer. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's my best guess here. Yeah, I know that there's a couple of different kinds of differentiation and, and certainly as far as I can tell, there's no signs of magmatic differentiation, which would be an indication of whether or not there's you know a greater differentiation uh, right. as well. So many, many lines of evidence that are possible. So, yeah. um, Willie's got um, a question. Are there any instruments aboard to detect water? Not, uh, not directly. Uh, there's a magnetometer that I didn't mention. Uh, there is a um, radiometer uh, that measures thermal sur the, the thermal emission from the surface. Um, there is nothing that will directly detect water under under the surface. Uh, we will use the hammering from the um, thermal probe to do what we call a geotechnical study. It's the same kind of study you would do when you're trying to uh, um, dig foundations for a new building. But that would be of the very shallow, maybe top 20 meters. Uh, won't, be, won't penetrate much deeper beyond that. We are, you know, the astronauts on Apollo actually did a seismic survey. They actually took mortars with them and fired them. And they had a line of geophones. They did an actual seismic survey. Uh, maybe one day we'll do something like that on Mars. But, uh, yeah. Well, we'll have to take a, a, an oil exploration geologist up to our geophysicist up to do that. They're really good at doing things like that. So yes, exactly. Um, Dan has a question. Uh, what Earth insights? I know you covered this to some extent, but um, uh, what Earth insights are they trying to get from this mission? What do you anticipate learning about Earth uh, from this? I think it's sort of. 
indirect uh, what we learn about Earth. As I said, we, we want to learn more about the formation of rocky planets, especially early in their evolution. I think maybe one intriguing question is, um, is the role of uh, plate tectonics in, in uh, sustaining life? Uh, the thinking is that Mars out early on in its formation was maybe reasonably hospitable to life. It's on the edge of the hab habitable zone in the solar system. So, um, you know, uh, as usual, humans uh, think or sometimes think, why are we so special? What's, what's so special about Earth that have, have, have plate tectonics where other planets do not? I know that the astrobiologists that I've talked to are very interested in that uh, topic. Uh, um, Chris McKay, who uh, many, many people on the webinar are familiar with, has actually had the contention that plate tectonics is a, uh, a constraint for life. That without that global recycling mechanism that you won't have an atmosphere that's sufficient to sustain life. Right. So Stuart has a great question. Do you have any plans in the event that Mars is seismically inactive or at least not sufficiently active to generate detectable quakes? So we cannot generate detectable quakes with insight. Um, we have floated concepts um, of um, putting a cannonball on uh, future missions and drop it actually uh, if you think about the error ellipse, there's actually very little risk of hitting insight. The cannonball that comes in ballistically into the planet, um, you could get pretty close and at least constrain with a 10 kilogram ball, tungsten ball, say, you'd be able to constrain the thickness of the crust, at least locally. Uh, that's, we don't have any concrete plan of, of doing that. This is just a concept. Um, also, uh, future missions like Mars 2020, uh, w they carry with them ballast masses for balance and they, they uh, drop them. Though we think that uh, it'll probably not be, it'll be too far for us to see it. However, we know dust devils generate uh, seismic signals. We know the atmosphere generates seismic signals. Uh, one of the hottest topics in terrestrial seismology is what we call noise tomography, uh, using the background noise uh, to study something about the interior. So not quakes, but if you, just, you can actually make sense of the noise uh, if you listen long enough. So I don't think it will all be lost, and it would be extremely interesting to find out that Mars is not active assuming we can prove that it's not because our seismometer doesn't work. Yeah. Well, you could always do an L-cross impactor and that would probably generate uh, a, a nice little signal, uh, I suspect, too. So. Yes. Uh, Linda has got a good question and, and I know that we're running a little bit late here, but we'll, um, I think we've got a couple of interesting questions here. And so if you don't mind. You yeah, know, not, not a problem. I can say that. Here. So Linda asks, what is the source of the seismic activity on Mars? And I think you alluded to that. Uh, is it uh, expected to come from meteor impacts alone or are there other causes of seismic activity? And I think that you alluded to that. Right, but maybe it wasn't particularly clear. So the main sources of uh, seismicity in a non tectonically active, not non-plate tectonic uh, planet are thermoelastic. It's basically thermal relaxation and thermal variation of, of rocks. Um, and uh, so just over time, just from the cooling of the crust and uh, the, the, the overburden pressure of uh, structures on the Mars, occasionally you get uh, cracks. It's a much slower rate of activity. Uh, the moon has that, but at a at lower, at the rate that is anticipated to be even lower than Mars. Uh, the moon actually has a lot of tidal quakes deep in the interior from the earth tidal pool. And it has a lot of rocks cracking on the surface. But uh, the main source of seismicity on Mars would be more of just thermal cooling of the crust. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, meteorite impacts. They're probably the two main sources. 
we, we anticipate, or we not, don't know really, models suggest that during a Mars year, we should be able to detect anywhere between maybe 20 to 150 quakes. Okay, well, we've got one more question. We'll make this the, the last question for the evening. Okay. So Jesse asks, what part of Earth's geology gives it its magnetic field and what differences do you expect to find based on Mars's magnetic field? So the Earth's magnetic field is generated by a dynamo mechanism, which the Earth has a solid iron core uh, and a liquid uh, metallic core that circulates around it and generates a very powerful electromagnet. So you have a, it's just like uh, uh, when you have uh, right to when you were a kid and you you take a, a nail and wrap a coil around it and put current through it, it becomes magnetized. It's the same idea. Uh, we don't think Mars has that. Uh, so Mars doesn't have a strong magnetic field. It might have had some magnetic field in the past and maybe some remnant of that is uh, is locked in rocks that were magnetized when they were molten and then um, froze. Um, we will measure the, the magnetic field uh, or local uh, magnetism, but it definitely doesn't have anything uh, like the magnetic field of Earth. And that's, by the way, actually thinking is one good reason why we have protective li protected life on Earth as if the magnetic field shields us from, uh, from, radi from charge radiation from the, the sun and the galaxy. Okay. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. I found this incredibly fascinating. You know, as, a, as I said earlier, as a geologist, uh, I, I have a fondness for presentations like this. So thank you very much, Jerome. This is uh, eminently fascinating. And uh, I think that we had some great questions from the participants. Yeah, I, I thank you. And thank you all for, for the, your time and your, your patience. And uh, Brian, Dave, you have my email, but please feel free to share it. Uh, if people want to send me questions, or maybe I didn't explain something well enough, or they have uh, thought of uh, additional questions, I'd be happy to get answers for them. And if you're willing to share the slides and uh, so we can put it up on the Night Sky Network website, we would like that. So maybe you could check with your uh, uh, PI and, and get permission to do that. We would appreciate that. We'll do that. So, thank you.